So I'm going to focus on a particular area of high performance computing that we've gotten a number of questions from many of you. Um, like many fields, high performance computing is one that has periods in which there's a sudden change. You know, some, some new, typically new hardware gets introduced into the, the marketplace and typically what happens at that point is the software research community um, does some work with that hardware, sees what can be done with it, and either hardware will be successful in that area or will fail. If it fails, it's written down to history. If it's successful, it will expand out into the, into the more general community. Um, and there, there's recently been, so typically there's a change and then um, there's incremental adoption of that change. And, and the last significant change in HPC really was the adoption of Commodity, HP, uh, commodity x86 clusters as a way to do high performance computing moving from the, the vector machines and, and um, uh, um, niche um, SMP machines that were used in the mid 90s. And recently, um, the use of many core processors led by uh, GPUs, um, using GPUs for doing general purpose computing has emerged as potentially a disruptive technology in HPC. And so I'm gonna focus initially on GPU and its applicability to Abacus. As many of you are aware, we've already released support for GPU with Abacus Standard, but I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what we've been doing beyond just Standard, looking at what we're doing with Explicit um, and you know, what, what we may be able to do with GPU going forward. Um, then gonna focus a little bit on the, the choice that we have to make. We're essentially at this point learning more about GPU and the, the um, second many core offering, which is an Intel product, um, and learning, trying to understand more of how we might be able to, to exploit GPU in our HPC offering. And finally, I will return to a little bit more of a non-GPU topic, which is just the, the continued expansion of HPC in our product line. And you know, HPC is, is widely applicable in, in the Simulia products at this point. It, it's, you know, it started off as being something that was very focused in just the, the solver applications. More and more it's used in a much broader scope. Um, so I, I won't, certainly won't be able to give a full overview of all of things HPC, but I did want to talk about one specific area, which was HPC applied to post-processing, which is a very interesting area. So I'll start with GPU. Um, and this is a topic of interest to many of you. Um, so just to, to introduce GPU, I wanted to just do a review of parallel architectures in general. And many of you are familiar with this. The, the typical machine used in HPC at this point in time is an x86 cluster, typically a, a number of machines um, connected by some sort of private interconnect represented here by the switch and the lines between the box. Typically the, the interconnect is InfiniBand. Um, more and more we, we are seeing 10 gig e emerging as potentially a six, successful solution. We sometimes see gigabit ethernet, but that's generally not a performance solution. Um, within the individual machines, you have um, typically two, sometimes four sockets or processors. Um, I'm using the term socket here because the term processor is overloaded and used for a number of different things. Within the sockets, you have some number of cores. Here I'm showing two, which is pretty low. It keeps the, the image simpler. Um, but really these days, you'll, you'll, you'll see anywhere between four and up to 12 cores in an individual socket. Um, and each of those sockets will have RAM that's associated with it, um, and the two sockets can access the RAM for the other socket, so, you know, that memory is generally accessible. There's a performance penalty for crossing to another socket's RAM. And then one other thing that I'm showing here is hardware threading or hyperthreads, which is within a core, you typically have, you can have multiple streams of execution that are going at a time. In the x86 world, this is not a particularly successful technology. In fact, if you ask us what to do with hyperthreading, we'll tell you to turn it off. Um, but I'm bringing it up here because it is quite relevant in, in the GPU realm, and so I just wanted to set the stage for that. So the, the new addition here is the offering of GPUs from NVIDIA and AMD. And essentially what happens is you can have one, two, N GPUs, typically one or two in a server. 
Those are connected to the x86 memory through a PCI bus. Um, and that's really the, the new stage, is what do you do with that hardware? And the, the reason that hardware is interesting is because it de delivers tremendous peak performance. Um, so, you know, in the, the peak performance for a GPU on the market today is somewhere between 500 gigaflops and a teraflop, which is something that you would get out of tens of x86 servers. Um, the trick is that they're not the easiest things in the world to parallelize or to, to program for, especially for an existing code base. Um, there's another offering that's emerging, which is the Intel Many Integrated Cores um, or MIC processor, um, which is somewhat a similar, um, similar offering. It's again a card that plugs into a PCI slot. Um, but it has some differences. I'm not going to say a lot about Mike because most of the stuff that we're doing is under NDA with Intel at this point. It's something that just the basic messages we're working with it, um, and more information will become available about that later in this year. So, in order to understand our strategy with with GPU, it's it's helpful to look at the components of the codes. And I'm talking here about standard and explicit, not the CFD code, and that's just because of lack of time. The, what we're doing with standard and explicit, we're also doing with the CFD side. Um, but if you look at kind of the key components of the Abacus standard application, there's a linear equation solver. I think most of you are probably familiar with this. The linear equation solver is a key performance um, a key performance component of standard. The cost of it increases with problem size, and the nature of the code, and this will, you'll see why this is relevant later in the presentation, is that it is essentially compute being done by dense linear algebra kernels, and then there's a whole bunch of control code, which is managing how the data flows through those kernels. The other key component of standard is the elements in the contact. Um, and there's, that code is element by element computation. There's a very natural parallelism in that code, and that's the key thing for performance in, in this day and age, is essentially where do you get parallelism from? How well can you, how effectively can you parallelize your code? And I bring that up mostly to contrast with, with explicit, which is again, um, elements are a, key comp are a key cost in explicit. Explicit does not have a linear equation solve, um, so that removes that, that element. Um, the, however, I did want to point out there's one key thing here, which is that the way the explicit elements are coded is vectorized code, and I'm going to explain what that is a little bit later, so tuck that one away in your memory. Um, the other parts of explicit that are important are contact and constraints and communication between, between nodes. Um, so the reason I'm hitting this is, is that the first step we've taken with GPU is to um, enable GPU execution um, for the linear equation solver. It's the most expensive thing. It's not a whole lot of code. Um, and it, it's, it's really the obvious first step to take with GPU. Um, the next thing we're looking at, though, is can we get the explicit elements to run effectively on GPU? And this is a non-trivial challenge, and it's what I'm going to focus on um, for the next, you know, 10 minutes or so of my talk. So, so I just wanted to set the stage with that. And, and the reason for looking at this is if we can get the elements for explicit to run on a GPU, we're very likely to be able to get a lot of the rest of the code in, in the overall code base to run on GPU. So just as a, um, there, there have been discussion of this in, in other presentations, but just to set the stage, what we've done with Abacus 612 is we've continued to expand the coverage that we have for GPU with Abacus standard. Um, the current um, offering in, in 611 allowed you to use one GPU on one server. Um, so that's, that's effective for certain classes of problems, but it keeps you from doing very large problems. And with GPU, we, we're not very effective um, on accelerating small problems. So you kind of, in the 611 range, you had to kind of hit this middle range. With 612, we've expanded the offering so that we now support multiple GPUs on a server, and we also allow you to use GPUs in a cluster. And the, the multiple GPUs on a server is important for the, the x86 cores. As you put more and more x86 cores in a box, 
you have to have more GPU capacity to, to offload compute onto the, from the x86 processors onto the GPU. Essentially, if you don't have enough GPU power, the x86 cores, you know, as you go from 4 to 8 to 12 to 16 GPU cores, the GPU cores essentially will the, the x86 cores will swamp a single GPU. So you need to start adding more GPUs. And this is, while we've made a step in 612, I would say this is, is a work in progress. Um, and you'll see I'm showing some results here, um, and I'm showing two problems. Um, one problem that's about a million and a half degrees of freedom, the other that's about three million degrees of freedom. Um, and I'm giving the number of flops per iteration, which is kind of an important metric for how well you're going to run on GPU. We're running on two hosts of Westmere, so two hosts with 12 cores each, 48 gig of RAM, and two NVIDIA C2070 GPUs. And you'll see that the smaller problem, the accelerations that we get out of GPU on running on 24 cores, so running on two nodes, are really, I mean, they're, they're useful, but not what we would hope for. We typically are shooting to get about a 2x gain out of GPU as a, as a benchmark for, for this is a worthwhile deliverable. Um, so on the smaller problem at this point, we're getting about a 1.3x speed up with one GPU per host, so it's two GPUs total. Um, a 1.4x speed up when we add a second GPU, so we're not necessarily getting that good a deliverable. If you look at the third column of numbers, though, I'm showing the equation solver, and you can see in the equation solver here we're doing better. Um, so the solution, it's, it's, we're not at the end of the road here, we just need to get a little bit more oomph out of the solution. When you go to the larger problem, the speed ups are actually fairly good. It's, you know, if you're only using a single GPU, you're getting 1.4x speed up, so still nothing to sneeze at, but um, when you go to two GPUs in a box, you're, we're up at 1.9, which is more what we're looking for. Um, so that's the, you know, so, uh, an update on standard, and, and expect that, that GPU performance out of standard to con continue to get better with, with the next few releases. There's quite a bit of room that we have to make that better. So the next thing I wanted to turn to was, was explicit. Um, and I wanted to do a little bit of a, just an overview of how you, how you can use GPUs. Um, the first and most obvious method for using GPUs is to just offload compute to the card. Just stop the x86 processors dead. Leave them idle while you've got compute going to the GPU. Um, shuffle the data over the PCI bus, put it on the card, and then when you're done using the, the GPU card or the mic processor, bring it back to the x86 processor. And this is it's an okay method except for that you're leaving a bunch of your resources idle half the time. Either the GPU is idle or the x86 processors are idle. So not a bad first step. It's, it's the easiest thing to do, but it's not a solution that will last the, survive the test of time. The second mode is a hybrid mode, which is where you're essentially running on the x86 processor all the time, and you use the you offload to the GPU whenever you can. And, and effectively there, you have to be constantly streaming data to the GPU. So the, a lot of scheduling work here. A lot of the, the magic here is in, in how you move data to the GPU effectively and keep everything busy all the time. And this is actually what we're doing with the standard equation solver. Um, there's a third possibility for GPU and mic in particular that's of interest in the industry overall, which is GPU and mic as a platform. And that's a case where essentially you will have an x86 processor, maybe an ARM processor, that is going to be basically the traffic cop. It's going to be the controller. But you'd really move all of your heavy-duty compute onto the GPU. And this is really what we're looking at is, is GPU or mic likely to emerge as a platform that would you know, actually stand on its own for the most part. Um, and so in order for that to be a reality, we essentially have to be looking at porting all of our code, having all of the code actually run on the GPU. And that's essentially what we're trying to evaluate. If that is a realistic possibility, um, certainly GPU becomes a very, very interesting um, a very interesting part of HPC, really goes well beyond being an accelerator for the x86 box. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit, go, go a little bit further down that route. And in order to do that, I first wanted to talk a little bit about just the basic methods of parallelism that, that exist to a, a programmer. And the first one, 
Um, and this is really focused on explicit. The first method that is of interest is the domain decomposition method. And this is what we do with explicit today. And essentially what happens here is you take your problem, you take the geometry, you divide it up into however many pieces you, you choose, typically the number of cores. So in this case, I've got the geometry divided up, you know, very simple geometry, divided up into four pieces. Um, which would be appropriate for four cores. And you assign each domain to a core and you, you do the computation on the core. Um, and so that's all very simple. Um, the only hitch is that you have to stitch things to, together at the domains is, is obviously, you know, your finite element problem is not for entirely independent pieces. Um, and so stitching things up at the domain is, is really the, the ch one of the challenges of domain decomposition approach. But other than that, this is a, a very effective approach. It's, it survived the test of time. Um, however, it's not an approach that works on GPU. Um, so the GPU approach is much more focused on the next technique that I'm going to highlight, which I'm referring to as vector parallelism. And this is something that, it, thinking back to when I said, you know, the characteristic of the explicit element code is that it's vector parallel. Essentially what vector parallelism is, is a way to do in a single operation, the same operation on multiple pieces of data at the same time. And if you have this type of code, it's extremely effective. And it's what the Cray supercomputers used to do. And um, they were very, very fast when you had the right code running on them. And the only problem was the price tag was a little stiff. Um, but that technique, that type of parallelism, is essentially re-emerging to some extent in GPU, although GPU adds a, a quite a bit more complexity to the picture. But as, as I said, and, and this is a, a key characteristic of the explicit element code, is partially because it was written for the Cray architectures, is that it is coded as series of loops that process n, what, what uh, I've called n group of elements, which is actually the variable used in the code. And it's basically just, it's a tunable that says you can process however many elements you want in a shot. And what you do is you have a number of loops, each processing a group of elements, and you take the first group of elements, in this case the first four, you process all of them in loop A, you go to loop B, you go to loop C, and those elements are done, and then you move on to the next set of elements. And effectively what happens with the right parallelism is that those elements are all processed all in one shot, essentially. Um, so, you know, if you, if you do it in the element by element style, one element at a time, um, you know, you would be running, say, that this, this problem ran in 100 seconds. If you go to a four-way vector parallelism, you get a 4x speed up. Um, so very nice technique when it works. Um, the, the thing um, that's important about this is that this is a very natural level of parallelism that applies to the GPU. And it's a level of parallelism that's built into the explicit code that we can exploit to get the code running on GPU. Um, so this is really was our next step with GPU was to say, okay, we've done the linear equation solver work. You know, we know where to go with that. That's moving forward. Now let's see what we can do next. Um, and the explicit elements are, are we're sitting there waiting to, to, um, to be processed in this way. And the results that we've had have been um, somewhat mixed, I would say. Um, and so I'll, I'm going to dig into the, the, in, to the GPU architecture a little bit more to explain what's been going on with that work. So the basic thing you want to take away from a GPU architecture is that it's highly parallel. Um, and so I'm going to do a little bit of a run through of, of a very, very high level view of the GPU architecture. And the basic message you should take from this is in order to run effectively on GPU, you have to be running... If you think of the, of the x86 cores, you know, you're running 4, 8, 16, 32-way parallel. On GPU, you have to be running tens of thousands of way parallel to get speed up out of the code. Um, if you run a single thread on a GPU, it's amazingly slow. Um, so essentially, you have to exploit parallelism across the board to get speed up on GPU, and that's a pretty challenging problem. Um, so the base GPU architecture, and I'm using NVIDIA as the example, um, AMD is similar, and it's got its own nuances, but a similar basic approach here. The GPU architecture, current Fermi, which is the current generation of GPU card, has 16 what are called streaming multiprocessors, and each of those multiprocessors has 32 
CUDA cores. Um, and a core on a GPU doesn't behave exactly like a core on x86, which I'll explain a little bit more. But your first level of parallels, you've got 16 by 32. That's your baseline parallelism in a GPU card. Now, to add on top of that, though, um, you also have what are called warps in, in the GPU world. And essentially, just think of this as a warp is 32 threads that must all perform the same operation. They can operate on multiple pieces of data, but they have to perform the same instruction. And on a streaming multiprocessor for an NVIDIA GPU, you can have 48 warps active at the same time. Um, and so that means that your, your real level of parallelism isn't 16 by 32, it's 16 by 32 by 48. Um, so you're getting up into tens of thousands of threads that you have to keep executing. Um, now, the next question is going to be, well, if I only have 32 cores, why am I executing 48 of these warps at the same time? Um, and this comes back to the idea of multi-threading, uh, of hyper-threading. Um, and the basic issue that is being addressed by having all these warps running at the same time is that there's a pretty high latency to get to memory on the GPU. And this is a, a problem with, with pro modern processors in general, is that as the processors get faster and faster, or are using more and more and more parallelism, is the ability to read data in from memory is a constant struggle. And so the approach that's been taken in GPU is to say, OK, there's going to be a very high latency to memory. Memory is very far away. But we're going to use a trick to hide that, that latency. And the essential trick, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, what you do is you have a thread that's executing here in stage one. Thread A is executing. Thread B is available. It has instructions. It, it knows it needs to get data. It's not actually executing, but data can be getting fetched for thread B while thread A is executing. And then thread A will run to a point, and in stage two, thread A will stall because it, it needs to get more data, and it's going to take a long time to get that data. So what happens is thread A gets put essentially on the st put aside. Thread B, which has had its data getting fetched while thread A was executing, has its data, it's ready to go, and you flip in thread A to execute on the hardware while thread, thread B to execute on the hardware while thread A waits. So essentially in stage three, you flip from thread A executing to thread B executing, and thread A is now fetching its data. Um, so it has time, it, it's not burning up compute time, but its data is getting fetched. Um, and this is used very aggressively in GPUs to hide memory latency. Good technique, except for it means that the programmers have to provide all those threads to be available to, to work at any moment. So that's the real challenge um, for um, GPU. And so with the Explicit, we've done a prototype with this. And when we were originally looking at this, what we were really concerned about was how are we going to get our code to execute on the GPU? And I spoke at, at the same conference two years ago and, and gave kind of a preview of GPU at that time. And at that time, that was what I was losing sleep over. Um, so it turns out that um, that problem has been tackled by NVIDIA, the Portland Group, um, CAPS, AMD, another number of companies have worked pretty hard to say, okay, you know, if you have code that in which there is, a, you know, a high level of parallelism available, um, there is a fairly automated route to getting your code to run on GPU. The original take on this was, well, if you want code to run on the GPU, you have to go rewrite that code. And then if you want code to write on the, run on the GPU and x86, you have to maintain two code bases. Um, and maintaining one code base is hard enough. Maintaining two is really not an option. Um, but th so that problem has been tackled. And we've successfully been able to move the C3D8R element code in Explicit, which is about 1,500 routines in total when you include all the materials that it, it can use, et cetera, et cetera. We've been able to move that code to run on GPU using a combination of scripts and compilers. Um, and it, it's, you know, it took us... Once we had kind of worked out the technique, it took us probably about a week to move that code. Um, and so we have the code running on GPU. Um, and so the next thing is the results. And we're essentially using the offload model here for the prototype is we just, we run everything but the element code on the x86 processor. So contact and constraints runs on the x86 side. And then when we hit the moment of the element code, we move the data over the PCI bus and run it on the um, GPU. So the performance out of this is if you look at a, a Xeon 5680, which is a pretty current Westmere processor, 
running on a single core, this code will take, in, in a particular problem that we're using, takes 357 milliseconds. Running on the GPU takes 21 milliseconds. So that sounds pretty good. Um, however, um, the one core comparison, not really a realistic comparison. Typically what happens these days is what we're seeing is you get about one GPU per socket. And so we're using the socket as a comparison point. And if you look at um, six cores of Westmere, which is a socket, um, the, the running in parallel on x86, you get that time down to 70 milliseconds. So you still have a gain out of the GPU, which is good. The gain's not nearly as glamorous as you might expect from GPU, and I'll talk a little bit, I'm gonna talk about why that's the case. Um, however, you know, 3x in the explicit elements is 3x. Um, it's, I'm sure a lot of you would be happy to get that. Um, there's one hitch, is the way we're doing this right now is we're transferring the data from the x86 socket to the GPU each increment, and this is the easiest way to program it. Um, and the only problem is the data transfer each direction takes 230 milliseconds. Um, so you got some gains on the compute side, but moving the data is a real problem. Now, this is a pretty simplistic implementation, um, so, so don't take that as, as the, the final word. However, what it does mean is that realistically, to run on GPU, you have to take the baseline data for the, for the elements, and it has to be created on the GPU, and it has to live on the GPU throughout the, the course of execution. Um, so that's an additional complexity, is, is managing the data for GPUs is, is definitely an issue. So that's where we are at this point. So the, the next question that is really interesting is, given the peak performance on these, on these cards, you, you wonder why we're seeing only a 3x speed up over a Westmere socket. Um, you know, the peak performance on a GPU is between 500 gigaflops for double precision and one teraflop, whereas on a Westmere core, on a Westmere socket, it's about 70 gigaflops, so why only 3x? Um, and the, the normal answer to that question in, in computing is, well, some, for some reason, you're not able to deliver data to the, uh, to the compute units. And if we look at the next number, so the next number that's interesting is memory bandwidth. And, and again, on just raw memory bandwidth, which is your ability to feed data to your compute unit, whether that's GPU or your x86 core, from your main memory, Again, GPU has very good numbers. GPUs are the high-end GPUs these days typically have about 150 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth, whereas your same Westmere socket is about 25. Um, so again, everything looks like that code should be running faster than that on the GPU. There's one key thing, though, is that your x86 processor has cache memory, which is um, a limited um, amount of very, very fast memory. Um, and that's used pretty cleverly in the x86 world to, to hide both memory bandwidth and memory latency. And effectively what happens here is if you look at these particular loops, and I'm going back to loop A, loop B, loop C, in the explicit code, and in this case I'm showing a little bit more detail though, is what happens as you process through the explicit elements is that we typically have some data that comes in, in this case I'm showing in one and in two as two arrays. You're gonna calculate intermediate values in temp one. You're gonna have a particular function. It'll calculate some intermediate values. You'll go to the next routine. Those values will be used and calculate some more intermediate values, and, and eventually you know, everything falls through the chain and you end up with your output from the from that element increment. Um, and the thing that happens here is these temporary arrays on x86 never leave the cache. They basically get calculated, they sit in the cache, and they never go to main memory. On the GPU, there is no cache. Um, there is a certain amount of local memory, quote unquote local memory, that's extremely fast. Um, it looks a little bit like a cache, but that local memory on the, is shared by so many thousands of threads that each thread can only have a teeny little bit of that high-speed local memory. So essentially, everything ends up going from to the main system memory. And that basically means that you burn up this tremendous amount of bandwidth that you have. And essentially, what happens is um, code that is that is data parallel, essentially. Not only are your instructions executed in parallel, but all your data is completely independent. 
is that you end up having to move a tremendous amount of data through the processor, and that ends up being the bottleneck on GPU. So the good news on this is that the roadmap for GPU memory is pretty aggressive. Um, so we certainly expect that these numbers will improve. However, this was not necessarily what we expected to see when we, when we went into this effort. Um, we expected that if we were successfully able to get the code to run, it would run significantly faster than it did. Um, so still, as I said before, 3x is 3x. So it's, it's um, you know, it'd be nice if it was 10x, but um, it, it's that, that's where we are at this point. And this is, for those of you who, who follow GPU, you know, you'll see a lot of examples with 20 to 50x. Um, and those examples do exist, but it's a kind of a particular code nature. So I did want to just say a little bit more about that. So, so what is the code that gets 20 to 50x? And in particular, um, you know, why is GPU parallelization for Abacus standard, the linear equation solver, kind of a more obvious route necessarily than explicit is? Um, so to look at that, I just wanted to, to go through what's a slightly different coding approach. So if you think of the explicit approach, it's, it's very much a series of, of arrays or vectors that are going to be used, and every element of the vector is completely independent of the other. So essentially, every operation is, is bringing new data in. You operate on the data once or twice, just a very small number of times, and then you're done with that piece of data. So as an example of a different type of, of algorithm is if you look at a matrix matrix multiply. And if you think of how a matrix matrix multiply is done, it's essentially take the rows of the A matrix. You know, you're, you're multiplying A by B to get C. You take the rows of the A matrix and the columns of the B matrix, and you're essentially doing just a series of dot products. Um, so if you're going to calculate C11 of the C array, you're multiplying row 1 of A by column 1 of B. And if you're going to do C12, second value, you're multiplying row 1 by column 2. So essentially, you have this high number of dot products. And what this means is that each element of A is used during the matrix multiply. Each piece of data in A is used n times. So, you know, if n is a fairly significant number, say 5,000, um, each one of those pieces of data is going to get used 5,000 times. So you have a very high degree of reuse in, in this algorithm. And that high degree of reuse is what really works well. Any, any algorithms where you're using data a lot, you have a large number of instructions, and, um, but a relatively small amount of data will go super fast on a GPU. It also goes quite fast on an x86 processor, but the G, this is where you get the big gains on GPU. Unfortunately, in finite elements, the number of operations that look like a matrix matrix multiply are pretty limited. Um, the equation solver happens to do the m large majority of them, and the equation solver is actually absolutely dominated by matrix matrix multiplies. So that makes doing the equation solver on GPU fairly obvious. And, and so you may have the question of, okay, if the matrix matrix multiplies so fast on GPU, why do you only get 2x on the equations on, in standard overall? And essentially what happens is that we're only feeding part of the work to the GPU, but that part of the work that we are feeding to GPU is accelerating by about 20x. Um, and that's why there's a lot of room in, in standard to keep making improvements, or in particular in the equation solver, um, with GPU, is that we've essentially just done the first pass on effectively scheduling work onto the GPU. Um, so there, there's quite a bit more that we can do to do that more effectively. So that's kind of an overview of, this is really a work in progress presentation on, on where we are with GPU. Is, is we've, we've done a fairly significant effort to, to try to evaluate you know, how broadly can we apply GPU with, um, to our code base. And there are definitely some challenges. So at this point, we're taking a step back and we're saying, OK, you know, we have the generic x86 parallelism that we've done over the past you know, five to 10 years. Um, we have this new technology, GPU, which requires a very different type, very different style of coding. Um, potentially some very great gains. Right now the gains are maybe not as great as, as the marketing might lead you to believe. Um, but so we're, we're at this point taking a step back and saying, well, where, where are we headed with this? You know, what, what's going to deliver in the next, the next big jump in performance in explicit and standard in our CFD code? Um, and we essentially, so I, I wanted to at this point take a step back and say, 
what, what are the challenges we face with the x86 side? Because as you all know, that you know, we scale in tens of cores and standard maybe into the low hundreds, um, but we don't scale to thousands of cores. Um, so let's, let's take a look at what some of the challenges are with the, the approach that we're using. And again, I'm going to focus on the domain decomposition side. And this is essentially the approach of just use more and more and more x86 cores, which means more and more and more servers. Um, and again, we do a domain decomposition, and I showed you that approach earlier. And if your elements are all doing the exact same thing, the domain decomposition approach is pretty straightforward. Um, but typically, your elements aren't all doing the exact same thing. One, you have different types of elements. Two, some of the elements will have plastic material deformation. Others won't. Um, so th the basic trick with a domain decomposition approach is keeping your work balanced between all your different compute resources or cores. And really simple example here, if you have something where two of your domains take two seconds each and one takes one second and you use those domains. If you split them up the smart way between two cores, um, you know, you can get three seconds each on the two cores. You get a speed up over the over six, all six seconds. But when you go to four processors, you're bottlenecked. The, you, because you have one domain that's taking two seconds, the maximum speed up that you're going to get is, is 3x there, even though you've got 4x four, four the number of resources. So that's a basic problem is that you have to keep, you have to figure out how to balance your work amongst the different processors. And that changes over the course of analysis. Um, the second problem, which is probably somewhat more challenging, is that we don't just do elements. We also have contact and we have constraints. And so if you come up with a decomposition that works really well for elements, um, it might not be the ideal decomposition for contact. And I'm showing that in the second case, is the, the contact is all in the right-hand two domains. And so while you're doing contact, your original two domains don't really have anything to do. And so we've got this uh, constant struggle of trying to balance the element work across all the processors, as well as keep the contact in balance at the same time. And that's a fairly difficult problem. Um, the other basic problem with, with just the lots and lots of cores approach to, you know, lots and lots of general cores approach to parallelism is, um, data communication. And, and essentially, this is, again, a fairly simple thing to see. I, I showed earlier that when you do a domain decomposition, you have to stitch things together on the domain boundaries. And it's a basic question of surface area here. As you split to more and more and more and more domains, you have to do more and more data communication relative to the amount of just baseline baseline compute that you're doing. And that's the second real challenge. And those two things are really the things that make driving scaling to thousands of cores difficult uh, in the x86 world. So um, where are we going? Um, so one comment that I did want to make is GPU is often thought of these days as I can use an x86 cluster or I can use a GPU. And the reality is, is that's not going to be the case for the long term. Is the strength of the x86 clusters has been, if you wanted to go faster, you had more hardware. Um, and a single GPU will still bottleneck you to, to what the single GPU can do, but there's no reason you can't create GPU clusters. And, and that's really where things will go. Now, this has an interesting characteristic, is if you look at a, a box today, a, a Westmere box, or, or in this case, the next gen of, of the... Um, Intel boxes or the AMD boxes, you, you get up to um, 16 cores in a box. Um, and right now, with the pure domain decomposition approach that we're using in Explicit, we're, we need to have 16 domains running on, those, on that one box. And that means a lot of communication that's happening. And if you look at what you might do with GPU, is you probably only have two GPUs in there. And if you can move all the work onto the GPU, you essentially end up with two domains on the box. And this is essentially you're introducing a hierarchical level of parallelism, is that you're saying, well, I've got my domain decomposition parallel approach, but then I'm going to use this GPU vector approach below it. And you can do the same thing on the x86 side. So it looks like whatever the route's going forward is we are probably going to have to introduce a second level of parallelism in the um, in, the, in actually both in standard and in explicit. It somewhat exists already in standard. Um, and this is really probably the next step. And then the question is, what are those different levels of parallelism? Um, and so we're really at the point of, of making that call. Um, so essentially, what's going on at this point is we've, we've followed the x86 parallelism path for a number of years. 
Um, GPU has introduced some turmoil in the HPC world. Um, and um, we, we are finding it to be very effective for appropriate workloads. Um, and there's certainly the possibility that GPU will expand out to become a much more general purpose processor. Um, and that's something that I would say the jury's still out on a little bit, but it is something that the basic message I wanted to give you is, is it's a difficult problem, but it's one that we're working on actively. And, and so normally in the SEC, we're talking about things that we've done and we're delivered. Um, but the work on GPU is, is pretty challenging. Um, and the work on generally pushing the x86 scaling is fairly challenging in its own right. So basically, I just wanted to convey to you, you know, that we are working on this hard um, and that there are a number of likely avenues where we can take this forward. Um, and essentially, we're learning a lot more about the, the new type of hardware. The fact that we're bandwidth limited on explicit wasn't necessarily an obvious thing to us up front. Um, we understand that now. Um, and we do have a number of areas where there are continued challenges. Um, but um, there's, I think, quite a bit of opportunity in, in the different forms of parallel that we're, we're looking into now. And so at that point, I wanted to just say, well, there's a third entry. Um, so I, I essentially am kind of lumping AMD and NVIDIA GPUs together. Um, the Intel mic processor is a slightly different animal. Um, I can't say that much about it because it's a little hard to figure out what's, what's NDA and what's not at this point. But essentially what we're looking at is, again, another form of putting lots and lots of parallelism into a smaller form factor in hardware. And as opposed to the in NVIDIA GPU, which is, or the AMD GPU, which is lots and lots of cores that have to, be, have, to have code executed in a very specific manner, Mike is a smaller number of cores. It does have cache memory. Um, and it may be more of a mix between x86 and, and the NVIDIA GPUs, but it's something that we're really just learning about at this time. Um, and what we're doing at this point is we're, we're doing some prototype work on the mic processor to understand more what's available to us through mic, and then we will have to put our heads together and figure out really where we're gonna go with, with HPC. So, whoops, sorry. Um, so that's a, a roundup on kind of the, the fundamentals of HPC, of, of what we're doing with GPU and um, what we're doing with x86 parallelism. But I did want to, in, in the core um, analysis products, and I did want to touch on one other topic. There are a number of other ones in HPC, but high performance visualization is another area where we've been very active. Um, and essentially what we're looking at here is, is trying to drive up to much larger model sizes. And those, those of you who do run very big models and post-process them with Viewer know that you can get your job done, but sometimes, you know, if you're getting up to models that are 25, you know, 20, 30 to 50 million degrees of freedom, um, sometimes the user experience is not the best. Um, and so we have done work on a new visualization product that's available in the Excite product line. Um, and at this time, this is, it's a pretty new product, but as you can see, you know, we're showing, we're, we're using it to post-process internally, especially on very large models. Um, and this is a, a solution that's, that's quite effective in the model ranges we have. Um, I'm showing here a 20 million degree of freedom aerospace model. And if you're using, you're post-processing this, you know, rotating the model around, it's pretty seamless. It, it's hard to tell that you have 20 million degrees of freedom instead of 2 million or, or even 200,000. Um, and we're testing models up to, to 200 million degrees of freedom at this point. So really next gen post-processing capability. The way this is architected is, is somewhat interesting. And if you think of visualization, there are really two operations that happen when you're post-processing. The first one is you read your finite element data and whatever analysis code you've used, standard explicit CFD, has dumped out a bunch of raw data. And the post-processor is responsible for taking that raw data and turning it into an image that makes sense to you, the engineer. Um, and that, the, the code that's responsible for that is what I'm showing on the left side is the visualization engine. And what that code does is, is read the simulation data, process the simulation data, and produce 3D visualization data, which you can th effectively think of as polygons. Um, you got a bunch of polygons that are then going to be passed on to the graphics card being used in its more traditional 
traditional form as a renderer. Um, and the code that we have in the, in the new product, that visualization engine is distributed memory parallel from the ground up. So, you know, suddenly your post processor starts looking more like standard and explicit have gotten to look. Um, the visualization engine will then communicate data to a rendering engine, which is a traditional renderer. Um, and in this case, this is the, the, the render from the V6 platform. It's very high performance. Um, and the user interface and rendered image are managed in the rendering layer. So the next part of that is what does this look like physically? Um, and essentially what you have is you have your visualization engine running on a back-end cluster, which is, or it, it can collapse down onto your workstation, but it can also run on a back-end cluster. It's close to your storage, um, so you've, you've run your analysis code, you've generated a bunch of data, and you're then going to read that data on the same set of hardware, at least a nearby set of hardware, to where your data was generated. You're not moving files all over the place, and especially when you're running these big models, the files are big, you don't want to move them around too much. Um, and then on the client side, there's the rendering engine, and the, clients, the client process here sends commands to the visualization engine and says, you know, I want to see contour plot of Mises. The visualization calculates your Mises contour plot, ships it back over the wire um, as graphics data, which is then rendered on the, on the client side machine and, and you see your image. And for those of you, I think for a number of you, this, this architecture will probably start ringing a bell because you can see that you have two machines, communication layer in the middle. So this is a natural feed into being able to do visualization remote, using a remote backend machine. And that's the direction where we're headed. We're not quite there yet in terms of, of the efficiency of, of doing remote computation if you're looking at something like doing your, having your visualization on a cluster that's in a di different geographic location or even on the cloud. Um, but you can see the direction where we're going here. So, um, and so this is a, a case where, you know, we're using the same HPC technology that we've been working on for explicit and standard for a number of years and taking it into a new area. And that's really critical to, to moving forward in general um, with simulation at that point, at, in this point, is to keep driving the times down, not just in, in the core compute code, but across the board um, with, with all the applications that you use. So the conclusions are that um, we, we certainly are at a point where there's a fork in the road in, in HPC hardware, and it's something that is, um, that's been a challenge for us. Um, and we are working on this pretty hard. We don't have all the answers at this point, um, but I certainly wanted to convey to you that, that there are likely going to be some fundamental jumps that will come up in HPC over the next few years. Um, the traditional use lots of cores x86 programming um, option, that approach remains viable, I would say. It's, it's not totally clear that GPU is, is going to disrupt the HPC market. Um, and so this is something that we're looking at pretty hard. And it, it's, it's really the kind of the hot topic in the, um, in HPC, in the HPC community overall. Um, and certainly the effectiveness of, of that x86 approach, that is something that can be used in a number of areas of the code. And you see this more and more you know, in, in visualization that I've mentioned, but also if you're doing optimization or um, DOEs, there's lots and lots of ways where HPC hardware can be effective in a wide range of areas. In some places it's already in use, in other places it's developing. But so it, it's... Um, I'll leave you with that as sort of the status of HPC at Simulia. <laughs>